Okay, let's do this. Uh, I got the creative juices working. I've done this before. I don't know if Saruti will remember. I've, I've done this before, you know, so I don't know if I'm ripping it off from anybody, I'm ripping it off from myself because I've seen other people do it as well. So I wanted to do it again. That is NFL quarterbacks as NBA players. So are you ready? Okay, here we go. Matthew Stafford, Kevin Garnett. Wait a minute. You're going to be kidding me. All right, look. Matthew Stafford has never been as good in his league as Kevin Garnett has been in his. Kevin Garnett's the better player, the more accomplished player, um, without question. But there's a storyline here, and these are kind of the rules. Some of it's storylines, some of it's comparable numbers. It's really my creation here, so it's kind of my rules. So I'm just going to have to follow along. Um, but I believe the way KG was appreciated far more, not only by a city, but by the league when he went to Boston and started winning, is going to be similar to what we have with Stafford. Now, I'm not guarantee, uh, guaranteeing a Super Bowl in year one for Stafford and the Rams, but I believe you're going to see Stafford this year with LA and go, oh, wait, like he is really good. All right, because let's go back to KG's career. The first seven years he was in the postseason, he lost in the first round. Think about what we would do to KG today. <laughs> Again, it's not like it was in the 30s when this was happening, but that's still pretty rough. Seven straight playoff appearances, seven straight times out in the first round. He actually got to the Western Conference Finals after that in 04, and then no playoffs 05, 06, 07, then wins a title with Boston in 2008. But when you think of KG now, what do you think of? Like, I know what I think of because I get to see it. And I covered him. I think I did 80-something games that year when they won the title, um, including all the playoff games. He's the ultimate winner. He was the selfless one. He was the one that would do all of the dirty stuff while also scoring and rebounding and passing and playing just balls out defense every single night. His his exertion, his energy level, all of those things, like you saw it night in, night out. And you're like, wait, people are actually thinking this guy was a loser because those are the playoff rules. And that was starting to happen with KG back when he got his career in this rut in Minnesota where... You know, you, you're not allowed to say this guy's a winner when he's losing the first round of the playoffs every single time. But why was that happening? It's because his team wasn't very good around him. I was looking up some of the stuff yesterday in preparation for this. Malcolm Gladwell did a piece on Garnett. And if you looked at the wins added metric, there were years where Garnett was averaging 30 wins added per season over like a long stretch in Minnesota. The rest of his teammates combined, I'm talking every other guy that played in the Timberwolves game during those seasons, on average, we're adding 16 wins. So Garnett was literally doubling the output in the wins added metric than every other guy that wore a uniform that season. One season, the rest of the team added nine wins, and I think he added 31. So that was the case. But we know how we talk about players, especially NBA players. And if you keep losing all the time in the playoffs, we're not allowed to say that you're actually a winner. And he was a winner just hanging out in Minnesota the entire time. And a lot of that is what I think is gone on with Stafford. I like Stafford. I think he's really good. And again, I don't think that his equivalence is KG level quarterbacking in the NFL. But if you look at his 12 years of Detroit Lions, and this is the expected points added metric that a lot of guys use. Again, no numbers perfect, but this one makes some sense here. Because if you look at Stafford in those 12 years with Detroit, and you do a combination of who they were as a defensive team and who they were on special teams, and then you look at the rankings of those combinations. They were only in the top 16, not top five, not top 10. The Lions as a franchise were only in the top half of the NFL three times on combined EPA for defense and special teams. The other, the three times they actually were in the top 16, um, that means nine times that they weren't. They won nine, 10, and 11 games. I don't think Stafford's been this top five quarterback the entire time. I just think he's really good. I think he's going to have a good season with the Rams, a better coach and better talent around him. And you're going to go, oh, maybe this guy is awesome. Here's another one for you. Ryan Tannehill, Bradley Beal. Now, I was going to do Tannehill Westbrook. I don't think that was fair to Westbrook. Although Oscar Robertson's saying that Westbrook should be the MVP. Oscar checking in. Every time I look at a Tannehill number, I can't believe it's what it is. Tannehill leads the NFL in yards per attempt. Now, with quarterback numbers, I used to think completion percentage was everything. The way they run some of the offenses, that's not the biggest deal anymore. Yards don't really mean all that much. But man, when your yards per attempt is number one in the NFL the last two seasons, like that's an important number because it doesn't mean you're just completing a bunch of passes. It means that you're actually getting the ball down the field. He has 55 touchdown passes, 11 rushing touchdowns, compared to only 17 turnovers the last two years combined. So that's 66 touchdowns, 17 turnovers, including fumbles, 13 interceptions. Every time, and they, look, that's just one. I could give you 10 Tannehill numbers. You're like, wait, what? It's kind of like with Bradley Beal. 
Beal averaged 30 and 31 the last two seasons. Two years ago, he actually averaged six assists. I like Bradley Beal, but I think he's been sort of available or most perceived to be available, although I don't think he's ever been as available as people thought he's been. So everybody's kind of waiting on the next Beal move. And I felt like if you got Beal, you would then think if you were just outside of being a title contender, you would be a title contender. That would be the way it would react. Somebody would go ahead and pick that team to then win a title because they added Beal. I like Beal. I think he's a lot closer to 20 than he is 10th as far as player rankings in the NBA. So in a weird way, Beal has become overrated, not because of him, but because he's always the name that we keep talking about being added to five or six different teams. If you looked at Tannehill's numbers and you got Tannehill, all right, not that he's leaving Tennessee anytime soon, but if you ended up with him, you'd be looking at these numbers thinking you got a guy just below Patrick Mahomes. We're not even think Tannehill's a top 10 quarterback. So the number's a little misleading for both guys. All right, let's do another one here. This is going to be the one that's going to get some reaction. Lamar Jackson, Rudy Gobert. There are two groups of people on Rudy Gobert. Jazz fans and analytics hostages, and then everybody else. And then with Lamar, there's two groups of people. It's, uh, I think, the people that are like me, impressed but still a little skeptical, going against former NFL players on television. So Gobert first. He's going to get you through the regular season. You're going to win 50-plus games. The plus-minus numbers will always be incredible. They'll be historic. Let's look at last year. And I got this number from Cleaning the Glass, which I think still had a few regular season games left. Not 100% sure. But the number is the number, and it matters. It could just be off by a tenth. The Jazz were 11.9 points per possession better defensively when Gobert played than when he sat. So you're talking 12 points better with him on the floor defensively than him off of it. Largest gap in the season last year, and one of the biggest gaps that we've seen in the NBA in the last 15 years. He's won three of the last four Defensive Player of the Years, but, and the big but, is the playoffs. He got played off the floor against the Clippers. To be fair to Gobert, it wasn't the greatest matchup for him, but the problem was, even though asking him to chase, to protect the rim and chase the corner, which was impossible, um, he couldn't do anything offensively to make the other team pay. And that was the biggest problem with Gobert. Not what he wasn't doing defensively because it was just way too much to ask of him that he then couldn't make the other team pay for going small. Could there be a matchup where Gobert gets through the West? Maybe. But we know what's going to happen. If the Jazz win 55 games, no one's going to care except for Jazz fans. Everybody's going to argue over and over and over again. You're going to hammer us over the head with all these plus minus numbers that are unbelievable. Yet, we saw it with our own eyes that in the playoffs, it was a problem when he was actually on the floor which is weird because he's like one of the most impactful guys historically when he's on the floor in the regular season. And that's what we've seen from Lamar. Lamar's numbers in the regular season are really impressive when you rule out that rookie year. Uh, he wins the MVP in his second season. He was first and seventh in QBR in the last two years. He's 30 and seven in his starts with the Ravens. We're pretty sure the Ravens are always going to be good, and they've built their team around him. And we can talk, oh, well, he'd be better if he had better outside weapons and, and more threats down the field. I don't think that's really what the Ravens want to do. I think they want to be built the way they're built because they're tailoring this to Lamar because in the playoffs, that's a problem. Four games, one and three. I'm not talking about record here, but let's face it. There's three bad ones. Maybe four. Maybe four bad ones is too harsh. We'd say three and then not a great one. And I'm not just doing wins, losses. It's, oh, in the win, he was pretty good. He'd made some plays. But the overall numbers are weird. He's got a three touchdown to five interception split. Only one rushing touchdown in the four games. Five fumbles, two losses. His QB rating goes from 102.6 in the regular season to 68 in the playoffs. His completion percentage drops almost 10 points, 64 to 55. And we've seen it with our eyes. There seem to be real limitations for a guy that through the regular season has won an MVP and looks unstoppable. But when it gets to the playoffs, again, maybe matchup like Gobert, if he hits the right run of teams, it won't matter. So there's some positive spin we can put on this. But as of right now, anybody saying that they're not concerned by playoff Lamar Jackson, I think is lying to you and to themselves. This one's quicker. Taysom Hill, Nick Stauskas. Self-explanatory. LeBron Brady, really easy. Not interesting, but I'll try to add one piece that makes it interesting. How many times have we thought both were done? I think that's the best comp beyond the obvious that I could go on and on. We already know what those are. The 2016 NBA Finals run by LeBron is one of the great accomplishments I've seen from a team, uh, considering the circumstances in my entire lifetime of watching NBA basketball. All right. And in 16, there was a very specific storyline that we need to remember. Steph was having the better season. We we're sitting there talking for a living, going, you know, Steph's probably the best player in the world right now. We love saying best player in the world. And LeBron was like, he may have had the better season, but I'm reminding you in these finals that I am the best player in the world. And he did. And we kind of counted him out a little bit. 
Um, and I think we'd understand and we'd all admit that as much as I love Steph, peak Steph is not peak LeBron in a playoff series. He just isn't. It's not that bad that you're behind me, the second or third best player of all time, but you get it. In 1920, the bubble season where they win another title, he was being counted out again. Remember some of that stuff? Oh, he likes movies now. As if you can't do anything but basketball. You can only like basketball, but this is what we do. When you have other interests or you do some other things, or sometimes when a golfer gets married and has a f-ing kid, we're like, ah, you know, I don't know if he really wants it as much anymore. And then guess what? Everybody that said because he was doing movies and he didn't want it, well, he was hurt the year before. They come back and they win that title. Brady, there's, there's probably times 10 years ago you're like, all right, the window is probably closing. I remember sometimes like I thought like it, it's more likely if you just look at the math, the window was probably closing. And guess what? Not only a few more Super Bowls, uh, they're off winning one last year in position to maybe win another one. So those two guys, again, like I said, beyond the obvious, aligned with the fact that they've been doubted, counted out, and then remind the entire fan base of their leagues. And it's like, yeah, actually, you probably shouldn't do that because people have lost a lot of money doubting those guys. Kyrie Irving, Cole Beasley. Mm. And that doesn't work, though. Cole is not a quarterback, not eligible for this one. I was trying to think of a Mahomes. I was thinking Giannis. Um, this is not a slight against Giannis. I just don't think Giannis is Mahomes, and that's more about who Mahomes is. Um, and I know some people that would probably say, no, no, let's, let's do that one. Let's force it. No, let's not force it. Let's stay on course here. I, I think that would be forcing it because as great as Giannis is, I don't think he is, is what Mahomes is. Sorry. All right, this is one that I enjoyed. Oh, wait, I have one other one here. Russell Wilson, Damian Lillard. The only comp there is shorter for their career, um, but the trade demand that isn't quite there yet. Yeah. And I don't know if that one's coming from Dame. I think Russell Wilson like was like, hey, can I try to be that guy? Because I've crafted being like the most liked guy or trying to be the most liked guy, but I don't really want to play here anymore. So how do I do this? Oh, no, people aren't going to like me. All right, I'm out. Um, they tried. They tried. They planted stories. Uh, they they weren't a hundred percent invested. You got to go. You got to go a little harder when you want your way out. And look, Aaron Rodgers went much harder. It didn't work out for him either. So that was one that I didn't. I didn't develop that one too much. This one I did develop. Daniel Jones, Mo Bamba. Why? Because you're holding out hope, and you probably shouldn't. We had other candidates here for the Mo Bamba inclusion. Marvin Bagley. Killian Hayes. This is the point with Daniel Jones. He's a high draft pick. And if you're a Giants fan, you keep remembering that, keep thinking about it. I mean, I looked at the Sando QB tier things again. I think he was like in the in the low 20s. Um, Somebody had him as a tier two quarterback, which seems insane. The numbers got worse last year. He's had a league high 39 turnovers the last two seasons, and that's in only 27 games. The Giants averaged just over 17 points per game in his starts last season. That was down uh, from his rookie year and behind the one in 15 Jaguars last year. I think we know who Daniel Jones is. Like, I know he can run. Yeah, I know he's athletic. Awesome. He turns the ball over a million times and he's a high draft pick that everybody's holding out hope for. And, you know, like a lot of the young QBs, especially the dual threat guys that can run a little bit, we have these moments in the rookie season where it's like, oh, look at this. Look at this. You remember McShay? McShay like had a, I think he had to, did he have to speak? on C-SPAN to talk about how he couldn't believe Daniel Jones went that high. And everybody's like, kill him. Stone McShay to death. I think you already have your answer. And you already have your answer on Mo Bamba. But with Daniel Jones, you just keep lying to yourself the entire time. Yeah, that's how I feel. Maybe I'll be wrong because I've been wrong about others like Josh Allen. And that's my final one. Josh Allen, Trey Young. This one is more personal because I didn't like either in the beginning. Josh Allen didn't complete enough passes at any stage of his career, and now all of a sudden he's like an MVP candidate. That's incredible. Uh, Trey Young put up much better numbers to start his career than Josh Allen did, so advantage Trey Young on that one, but I didn't really know what it meant. Um, They were a bad team right before they fired their coach and got some people back this year, but they had a bad record again this year, and then they run through the rest of the regular season, and what I saw from Trey Young in the playoffs was uh, not just the numbers, his command, his fearlessness, uh, the stuff that you really want, where now you feel like, hey, we have a franchise guy, a face of the franchise if you're an Atlanta Hawks fan. And that's what you have with Josh Allen, the Buffalo Bills. Because what he did last year, and I don't even know if he's 
going to repeat that, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be statistically the exact same guy, but you have somebody knocking on the door. If he has another season like that, this is somebody we're going to start talking about potentially being in the top five conversation of quarterbacks as we filter out some of the older guys. We've already kind of gone through one stage of that. There's some other older guys that are going to get out of the way, and that's a possibility. I'm not saying it's a certainty, but it looks pretty promising. And I know Bills fans, you do it every single time. No, he was actually really good. You guys are all dicks. You're national media guys. No, he wasn't. His number sucked. Yes, I know it was about weapons. Um, I hear it from you every time. I'm going to hear it from you again. But here's the point. None of that matters because if you're the Bills, you have somebody that gives you a chance every single Sunday because you may have that position. You may have an advantage of that position for a decade. That's how special he could be. And it's the same thing for the Atlanta Hawks and Trey Young in that now we have a real guy. We have a guy that can carry us emotionally through those tough times beyond just the scoring. And that's where I've, I've become a much bigger fan of Trey Young. Send me yours, and I'll never read them, at Ryan A. Russillo on Twitter.